Uh, we are, like the MCs mentioned, we are in the, the very end of a series we've called 10X, where we've been studying the life of a guy named Daniel. And our, our, our key scripture for this text, uh, for these conversations, has been Daniel chapter 1, verse 20, which says, In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, that's Daniel and his buddies, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And so our premise up until this point has been that God, like we saw with Daniel, his intention is to multiply and move exponentially in our lives. And that's been the focus of the first 10 weeks, but now we're in week 11, and I think Daniel has a message for all of us. Daniel chapter 7, verse 28 says, This is the end of the matter. It's the end, it's over, it's the grand finale, it's all been leading up to this moment. Everything that we've studied in Daniel gets to this point. Daniel says, this is the end of the matter. Turn to somebody and say, it's the end. Turn to somebody else. And you know, like um, in wrestling, when someone was clearly winning, they do like, it's over. Turn to someone else and go, it's over. Like, come on, like a little bit aggressive, it's over. All right, let's pray together. God, thank you that you're here. Thank you that your word is alive. And as we look to it today, we trust that it'll speak to our hearts and our situations in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have been uh, following the story of Daniel closely. We've journeyed with him uh, for six chapters, Daniel chapter one to chapter six. It is a chronological historical record of his life from the age of 16 when he and some of his young friends were taken from their home in Jerusalem, brought into exile in Babylon. Uh, they, they faced all types of trials and temptations. They lived in Babylon through multiple kings and different regimes, but the whole time they lived with integrity, and because of that, God continued to elevate them, multiply them, and trust them with responsibilities. The, the first six chapters of Daniel, if I could summarize it with one word, would be the word refusal. It's about a guy who refused to bow to culture. About a guy who said, I'm going to stand firm. I will not compromise my values, my beliefs, and my convictions. Daniel refused. Um, but then it shifts in Daniel chapter 7 to 12. So the first six are about his refusal, but the next six chapters aren't chronological. Um, they're not about current events that Daniel's participating in. The next six chapters are about revelation. They're a revelation that Daniel receives from the Lord about the future, how things are going to play out in the end. So you've got the first six, which is his refusal to bow. The next six, a revelation about the end. The first six, essentially, what did Daniel do? The final six, we get a glimpse into why he did it. Why did he live the way he lived? Uh, the final six chapters of Daniel are uh, apocalyptic writings. So they're about the end times, what happens at the end of the world as we know it, REM, 1987. Nobody cares, I'm old. Uh, but uh, well, often when Daniel is preached and people go to the book of Daniel, you kind of just float past chapter 7 to 12 because they're a little bit crazy. And um, it, we like the fiery furnace. Uh, we like the lion's den. You know, and you see kids today, they are not going to talk about Daniel chapter 7 to 12. We stick to the furnace and the lions because they're cuddly and warm, um, which is understating both the furnace and the lions. But um, once you get into chap chapter, chapter 7 to 10, uh, you got to get into like the four beasts and the ten horned dragon and final judgment and the end of the world. And uh, we're going to save that for this room. And it's important, though, because what we believe about the end actually matters. What, what we believe about how things are going to end someday not only matters because we have to believe the right thing, but it matters because what you believe about eternity will shape how you live in the present moment. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll talk about something else for a minute because some of you are like, ah, this is heavy. Is he going to talk like this on Easter? Um, no, it'd be a little different. Okay, but we're here today. Um, we watch a lot of sports in my house, like a lot, like maybe too much. Um, they're definitely too much, actually. And every Saturday night from October until, uh, well, 
It's actually October till May. Uh, I realized as a Leafs fan, this is crazy, except for the pandemic season, the Leafs have never played in June, which is wild because June is when the Stanley Cup playoffs really get going. They've never been there, okay? The last time the Leafs were in the Stanley Cup final, the season wasn't that long. So they've never played in June. So I'm really committed from October till May about the time the Leafs lose. Um, but we, we're just a sports family, or at least I'm the dad. I set the tone, so we're a sports family. And uh, we watch a lot of football. So Sunday afternoons, Thursday nights, Monday nights, we're watching football. There's something about live sport. It is the ultimate in reality television. You can have Survivor and you can have, what's the one where everyone, Amazing Race, and then there's the, the one with the, road, the Bachelor. That stuff's just gross, but you can have it. I'm going to take, I'm, I'm going to take live sports because you've got these men battling it out for supremacy in their, in their given arena and you don't know what the ending's going to be and it's unpredictable and it's wild and it's crazy and, and it tugs on your emotions and it's stressful and anxiety goes up and down. And even last night, I'm watching as the Leafs have a commanding lead on the Oilers. And I started to get some texts from Oilers fans who were trying to admit their defeat early. I got a couple texts after the end of the second period, five nothing Leafs, and so a couple of fans, Oilers fans wrote me with things along the lines of, wow, looking good for the Leafs tonight. Oh, this is a bit of a blow up. But you know what, I know the Leafs. So I didn't say anything confident back to them. I said, it's too early to tell. And wouldn't you know it, by three minutes and 30 seconds left in the game, it's now five to three. And we are on the edge of the, I was on the edge of the couch watching my heart racing, full of stress, thinking they're going to blow it again. And I, I've watched as a fan the emotion and, and been on the emotional roller coaster while my team blows leads in the final moments. I've also been on the other side of it. I remember Super Bowl 51, the GOAT, Tom Brady, down by 25 early in the third quarter to the Falcons and led a comeback, greatest comeback in sports history. And everyone's freaked, or I was freaking out. Like it was, it's, it's, it's this wild thing. Now I like to watch the highlights of the games. So I will watch the hockey game. I will watch my team win. Then I will watch the post-game analysis and the breakdown of how they won. Then I'll watch the early edition of Sports Center, like I've never seen it before. And then at, at like 10 o'clock, I'll watch the late edition of Sports Center. And my wife gets judgy, but I shut her down. She got judgy recently. Why do you need to watch this again as she's finishing watching my best friend's wedding or the proposal to which she knows the ending and knows all of the words? That's Hollywood. That's not even real life. Sports is real life. Now, what I don't understand are guys who PVR the game. You don't make any sense to me, sir. You know who you are? I know who you are because I've had conversations with some of you, and I'm not going to point you out in the middle of a crowded room like this, but I believe that the Holy Spirit's convicting you right now because you, you're socially awkward. You set your recorder to record the game. Then you come to church. You're in a room like this. You're like, don't talk to me about the game. I don't know. My phone is on silent on airplane mode. I don't want to talk to anybody about the game. And you just kind of come in, head down. You're like, man, what's with him? Oh, he PVR'd something. Ugh. And you think that you can now go home and watch the game after it's over. And you're going to subject yourself to the emotional roller coaster of events when everybody else knows how it ends, but you're going to be stressed out like you don't know. That. I'm, I just don't have the patience for it. I, you think when I go back there, I'm praying for the service. I'm checking sports scores. <laughs> I check the scores because I'm just a need to know guy. I just have to know. If the game is over, I wanna know how it ended so I don't have to be stressed out for the rest of, the rest of the day not knowing. Now listen, there are two types of people when it comes to the end times or the end of the world as we know it. On one side, 
You have the people who look at the end and think, man, it is unpredictable. Anything can happen. It's wide open. I'm stressed out. I don't know how it ends. You've got the game PVR'd, but you refuse to check the highlights. You're like, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. I'm not going to read what the Bible has to say about the end. Keep me in the lion's den. I don't want to think about the end of the world. It messes with me. And then you've got the other people who have watched the eternal highlight package. And we've seen that God provides in multiple points in scripture a glimpse into the end saying, hey, the game is over, I win. And, 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 and so there's this comfort that comes from knowing that God rules, God reigns, he controls the past, the present, and the future, and he wins in the end. So there's this group that's stressed out because we don't know what happens. Then there's those who've checked the highlight. You've watched Sports Center. You, you know what's coming. Daniel chapter 7 gives us the big rocks on the end. Uh, there are a lot of things about the end we don't know. Jesus said himself that, that even he does not know the day or the hour when God is going to tap him on the shoulder and be like, hey, buddy, it's time. Ride in on your cloud. There, there are things, if you get into uh, other chapters of Daniel or you get into the book of Revelation, and, and it's important to study and know these scriptures, but there's so much in there that nobody really knows exactly what's happening. There's seals and scrolls and beasts and wars, and anybody who says they've got it figured out is a liar. I remember being uh, pretty young, um, and my parents, uh, some people from the church, they went to at the time were reading this book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. <laughs> sold a lot of copies in 88, sold no copies in 89. <laughs> right? Because nobody actually knows. So there's a lot of things that we have to be open-handed about because we just don't know. But Daniel gives us this eternal highlight package in Daniel chapter 7. He says, hey, here are a couple of big details that we know. There are some closed-handed things that if we have a healthy understanding of what is to come, you can live hopeful and not fearful. So Daniel chapter 7, are you ready for some beasts and some dragons and some horns and some fire? Okay, good, I thought so. All right, it's going to be fun. All right, Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon... Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. So Daniel chapter 7 to 12, it, it's not chronological. Uh, we know that, that uh, Belshazzar was a king that he served under at one point. So while Belshazzar was king, Daniel had this moment where he writes down this dream. Okay, um, It's an interesting spot because... From Daniel chapter 1 to 6, he's the guy that interprets dreams and visions. Now he's got a dream and vision that he can't figure out. And we're actually going to watch a conversation between Daniel and an angel who comes to give him the interpretation. Daniel said this in chapter, verse 2 rather. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me were four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. And four great beasts, each different from the other, came up out of the sea. So the sea is always a symbol of chaos. It... Um, Mythologically, it's the natural home for monsters and creatures. So he's like, out of the chaos, there were these beasts. And then he gives us the descriptions of these four beasts. Uh, it says, the first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lift lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being. And the mind of a human was given to it. So you've got this winged lion. Uh, this from history, we know, is an image associated with Babylon. A symbol for Babylon was a winged lion. The wings were torn off, which meant at one point it was soaring, but then it was grounded, and it had the mind of a human given to it. Now, you might remember that Nebuchadnezzar at one time was great in power, was soaring, then lost his mind. This is a picture of the kingdom of Babylon. Then it goes on in verse 5. It says, Then there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth and between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. So you've got this lumpy, disproportionate bear, okay? And on, it's big on one side, small on the other. This is the Medo-Persian Empire because the Persian side of the empire was much stronger than the Medes. 
and it says uh, it had ribs in its mouth. So it had already conquered and taken territory. But then it says, man, go and eat some more. So even after the Medo-Persians had taken territory, they went back and continued to conquer and overtook Babylon. Okay, then verse 6, after that. I looked in there before me was another. Is this a, you know what? I take back all the stuff I said about not talking about this in EC Kids. These would be great coloring sheets, actually. <laughs> so maybe see why we can make that happen. After that, I looked in there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and was given authority to rule. So you've got this winged leopard. Leopards are fast. It's ferocious. Uh, it just keeps moving and moving. It's got four heads, so it can see in all directions and move quickly in all directions. And from history, we know that this represents uh, the Greek Empire. Alexander the Great conquered Babylon, conquered the Medes and Persians, defeated Darius, and he did it quickly. By age 33, folklore says that at 33, um, Alexander the Great actually wept aloud because there were no more kingdoms to conquer, uh, he would die young. And then, again, you've got four heads here. The kingdom was divided and leadership was given to four different generals. Okay, verse seven, the last of the crazy animals. After that, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and had 10 Horns. So this fourth beast is the most terrifying of the beasts. Some artists' renditions of this beast have it looking like a dragon. It's got large teeth, is violent, crushes and tramples everything in its path. And the ten horns, horns are a sign of power, so it's incredibly powerful. Uh, many think this is a picture of the Roman Empire, which would reign in peak power for almost 500 years. But some historians from start to finish say it, you could make a case that the Roman Empire was around for about 1,700 years. So big, powerful. Then Daniel says, well, I was thinking about the horns. Because you see all these just like, oh, I was just thinking about them. And there before me was another horn. A little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. So you've got this little horn that comes up, uproots the other thorns. It was under the surface, but had, so it had always been there. It's got eyes like a human because it can draw you in. And it's got a mouth that speaks boastfully or arrogantly. The sound of this horn was a sound of pride. Okay, so you're like, so let me just, this is, now remember, this is like 2,600 years ago. And so even though these animals seem wild to us, um, it's not crazy to think that certain countries were identified by animals or combinations of animals. Um, we still identify countries by animals today. In 1974, the beaver was given official status as Canada's symbolic animal. I struggle with that for a lot of reasons. One, it says it was given specific status. Like, was there a group of beavers petitioning the government saying, we'd like to be recognized? I don't think that happened, which means there was somebody in Canada who thought we need an animal and they overlooked the moose and they overlooked the cougar. They overlooked the black bear and the grizzly bear and the, all the bears, they just overlooked them all. None of the bears, not a wolf. They thought, some government think tank thought, it's the beaver, that's who we are. So it's not crazy to have animals represent country. I mean, th think about the United States for a minute. Um, they're even their political parties. The Republicans are an elephant. The Democrats are a donkey. And the United States is an eagle. So now fast forward 2,600 years from now, you could read, with a beaver to the north, the elephant defeated the donkey and ruled the eagle. And everyone would be like, what is going on? So just... So it's okay if some of these pictures seem a little bit weird. It'll seem weird in a couple thousand years. Um, so Daniel is freaked out, and uh, the angel shows up and gives some context to what he's seen. It says this in Daniel chapter 7, verse 15. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. 
But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. So Daniel has this wild vision. It's freaking him out. And he, he's got all these details. And then the angel comes. And in one verse, one sentence, the angel's like, oh, Daniel, don't worry about all the specifics. Those are just the four kings that will rise from the earth. Now, of course, they're dangerous beasts. And we understand, as because we've been looking into Daniel, that behind the leadership of these empires are evil forces. They are the same forces that are at work today. We've already established that there is a devil, and behind the perversion and evil and corruption in our world and in our culture is a master architect who is Satan, and he is, he is the architect of these four kingdoms, and, and he's the one that's made sure that each successive kingdom is worse than the one before it. So the angel gives Daniel like a really simple answer, but Daniel's not satisfied. So in verse 19, which we're not going to read, Daniel basically is like, hey, yeah, but what about the fourth one? The fourth one really scared me. I'd love to know more about the fourth one. It seems like that little horn is really making things difficult on the saints, and it's waging war on God's people. And so what does the angel say in response? Daniel 7, 23 says, he gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It'll be different from all the other kingdoms and, it, and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The 10 horns are 10 kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise. Different from the earlier ones, he will subdue three kings. He will speak against the most high and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. Okay, so man, what's going on? So the angel responds to Daniel it says, Daniel, um, yeah, so that fourth beast, that's a reminder. It's going to be a trying time for the saints. Life will not always be easy for God's people. And, and you can see the exact tactic. It says the evil one is going to speak against the Most High. So culture will hate God. It's going to happen. Then it says the, the evil will try to change the times. What does that mean? That means try to adjust our priorities, redefine what matters most, get people to live investing themselves in the wrong thing instead of the right things. Then it says the laws, try to change the laws. What is that? Absolute truth will be under attack. The authority of scripture will be under attack. Morality will be under attack. Things that have been obvious and absolute will become confusing to the people who listen to this loud mouth that speaks only pride. Now, if we just look at our current world situation, we can see that all of these things are currently happening. We live in a culture that by and large hates God and, and anything to do with God. Uh, we live in a culture that is trying to reorient the priority of the individual to be about things that do not really matter. We live in a culture that is trying to change absolute truth and the law. The morality of scripture is under attack. And things that have been obvious and absolute since the Garden of Eden are now being thrown into confusion by an enemy who speaks with pride and deception. All of that's true. The angel's like, yeah, Daniel, all that's going to happen. He says, but... We win, man. Like you've seen the highlight package. Don't miss the point. And, and I, I want to encourage you today. Verse 25 of this text in the ESV says, the enemy will wear out the saints. There are people, I'm sure of it, in this room, in our Southwest room, and you have moments where you feel worn out. I'm done I'm exhausted, I'm oppressed, I'm tired. I just feel worn down, life is so heavy, I can't keep moving forward. Can I encourage you today? It's not crazy to feel worn down. You're in a war and war is exhausting. And sometimes we forget. We're just living our lives wondering, man, why are things so complicated? And why are things so difficult? And why am I struggling? Because there's a devil who's waging war on you. It's a war zone. 
There's a war for your marriage. There's a war for your health. There's a war for your children. There's a war for your emotional health and your mental health. There's a war for your families. There's a war for your future and it can be exhausting and there will be suffering, but don't forget the eternal highlight package. We win in the end. And Jesus said, you will have trouble. There will be suffering. There will be hard days, but I have overcome the world don't forget so the angel's like Daniel don't forget the rest of the vision look beyond the suffering to the eternal highlight package and and so what was the rest of Daniel's vision what says in Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 he says as I looked thrones were set in place the ancient of days took his seat that's God his clothing was white as snow the hair of his head was white like wool His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before. Imagine that, hey? God on his throne, big long white beard, thrones on fire. He's got wheels on his throne. You know what that means? He's not stationary, but he's active and he rules and he reigns and he's getting ready to move. And it says thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated. And the book's open. (sighs) Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I, I think it's important to know that the devil will keep speaking lies and pride and deception until his very final moment. He will not let up. But I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The angel's like, exactly! Daniel, dude, in the moment of judgment, the power will be taken away from the enemy and he'll be completely destroyed. And Daniel's like, yeah, okay, but then I saw in my vision at night, verse 13, I looked and there before me was one like the son of man. That's Jesus coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign powers. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And the angel's like, Daniel! That's what I've been trying to get you to see the whole time. And in verse 27, the angel says, yes, then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over. Now catch this, Daniel chapter 7, 27, it'll be handed over. It doesn't even say handed over to Jesus. It says handed over to the Holy Spirit people of the most high that's the saints that's the church that's anyone who believes in him and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him jesus christ is not an eternally suffering savior he did not stay on the cross He did not stay in the tomb. In fact, we will celebrate next week that he rose victorious. And and when he returns, he will return in victory. He'll come riding on clouds in his glory, crushing the enemy and raising up the church to rule and reign with him. So listen, let's just take a minute. Life is crazy, but let's look at the highlight package. I know that in this room, there are situations right now that do not look good because we live in the days of these beasts. They have power, they oppress, they hurt, they kill, they deceive. Some of the beasts have human faces. I have no doubt that historical figures like Hitler and Stalin People who oppress the, the, the persecutors in Sudan and China and North Korea. Like, there are people that legitimately do terrible things to the innocent. Some beasts show up as institutions and economic systems and ideologies and political agendas. Other beasts show up as these impersonal manifestations of the brokenness of our world. It's cancer, it's sickness, it's sex trafficking, it's child poverty, it's warfare, infertility, hunger, grief, loss, death. We live in a world of terrifying beasts. But the highlight package tells me this world will not last forever because Jesus will return. And someday... 
The clock will hit zero and the final buzzer will sound and the enemy will be forever defeated. Wrongs will be set right. Tyrants will be dethroned. All that is broken will be fixed. Hunger will end. Sickness will be cured. Tears will be wiped away. Mourning will be turned into gladness. Joy will be your portion. That on that day, even death, which is the last weapon of evil, will have its power broken once and for all. And Satan will be bound, Babylon will fall, evil will be destroyed, and we will rule and reign with Christ in eternity. That's what's coming. So we don't need to have a fearful theology. We don't need to have a fearful understanding of what's next. We can have a hopeful outlook. We know how the story ends. When Christ returns, it's not for our rescue. He's not coming to try and get you out of this big bad world. When Christ returns, he's coming so we can rule and reign with him because our eyes are not fixed on the moment but on eternity. So what do we do? Because the game's not over. It's still happening. We know how it ends, but we're in the middle of it right now. How do we live? Just a couple of quick thoughts before we're done today on how we live in light of eternity. Number one, don't break. Don't break. We believe that God is presently on the throne and will ultimately triumph. So in the meantime, whatever the cost, whatever the suffering, stand firm in your faith. That's the message of Daniel. That's what Daniel did. He said, I'm not going to bend. I'm not going to break. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 17 says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We fix our eyes on what is unseen. The the way forward for the believer is is a life of, I will not break. I'm gonna be obedient. I'm gonna be obedient to God. Listen, Daniel was obedient all the way into the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were obedient all the way into the fiery furnace. Joseph was obedient into slavery. Paul was obedient into prison. Uh, Jesus was obedient unto death. And, And obedience will not always get you applause, but obedience will have you standing in those final moments. Not everyone will understand Maybe not everyone in your life will approve, but the need is too great for us to break now. We have to stand firm in our faith. We know, we know how it ends. We win. So don't be a PVR Christian. Don't be the kind who are watching things unfolding in the world and you're like, this is terrifying. I'm so stressed. I'm so overwhelmed. I have so much anxiety. And you're stocking up on canned goods and living off the grid. No, check the highlight reel, everybody. We win. Stand firm. The second thing we ought to do in light of eternity, we should build his church. We are part of the body of Christ. Last night in the Leaf game, when they were dominating the Oilers, crushing them. (laughs) Merciless beat down, really. Um, With about three minutes and 30 some odd seconds left to go, The Oilers scored a goal. You know, McDavid, someone just needed to hit him. Um, But he scored, and it was cheap and dirty. Uh, But on on that play, the Leaf goalie, Ilya Samsonov, injured himself. And I know you're like, I don't care. This is, you will care in just a second. So... We're watching, and he goes down. And he's had some ups and downs this year, and he's been playing real well. And so he's injured on the ice. And so from my house, a sound of prayer and intercession began to rise up. We're praying in tongues. We're like, Lord, we're just going. We're like, I'm extending my hand towards the television, believing for a miracle. God, you can shoot healing into that left leg right now on the ice. He didn't play anymore. He got up kind of hobbled, like, you know, just kind of slowly, gingerly goes to the bench. Now, here's what's amazing. He was taken out and couldn't finish the game because of an injury. But three minutes and 37 seconds later, when the clock hit zero, guess what? He still won. You know what being part of the body of Christ does? It means not every day is going to be perfect. 
There are going to be days when you feel weak and overwhelmed. There are going to be moments when you feel tired and exhausted. There will even be bad days when you've done bad things. But I'm telling you, when you're part of the body of Christ, you can be encouraged and lifted up by the community of the saints. That you might have a terrible Saturday, but you come in here on Sunday, and we're going to strengthen you. And you might not have faith for your situation, but somebody in your row does. And they're going to lift up about Jesus being a firm foundation. And that might just strengthen your resolve. And guess what? You can be injured. You can fall. You can have some mistakes. You can be taken out of the game for a moment. But when you're on the team, you still win. That's why we're the church. Because we're in it for one another. Samson off's a winner. You know, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, Peter says, We're like living stones being built up. We're living stones into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. That's you and I. I, I like this language, this living stones. These, it's precious stones. It's something of value. You know why the, the churches from the 1300s and the 1400s and the 1500s, you know why a lot of them, especially if you go to Europe, are still standing today? Because they weren't wood frame drywall structures. The people who had the vision to architect those buildings thought we are gonna build something that will last. We're gonna build something that will proclaim the glory of God from one generation to another generation, from one century to another century. So they're built with marble. They're overlaid with gold. There's just something different. They understood we are building something of value. Now, what they didn't catch was the real value is in how you build the lives of an individual. But I believe the principle holds. We're building to last. When you build the church, you're building something that will last. We're building into people. We have a heart to reach people that will then reach people that will then reach people. We have a heart to see people set free who will help others get set free, who will help others get set free. We want you to have your addiction broken so you can help somebody else break addiction and help somebody else break addiction. That's the heart of the church. We're building now for our children, but not just one generation. We're building for the next and the next and the next why because we're building something to last we've got cathedral vision we're building something that will last and proclaim the glory of God now you might say pastor Jonathan why why on earth if Jesus could return at any moment why would we why would we invest in the church and build the church and keep going well it's just a weird argument because you know you're gonna die but you haven't died yet, but you still believe it's going to happen. So just because Jesus hasn't come back yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And so we invest. What a better way to live. There isn't anything, anything better I can think of than to give my life wholly to the building of his church and the reaching of people. And you know what? If he comes back tomorrow, then we did everything we could. And if he comes back in a week, we did everything we could. And if he comes back in a hundred years, then I'll be dead and gone. But I'll know I did everything I could because we're building to last. I'm not gonna break. I'm gonna build. The final thought is wherever you're at today, my question would be, do you believe in Jesus? Because, see, he will return someday. And when Christ returns and court is in session and the book is opened, it's not just the devil and his demons who will face judgment. Because the truth is, all of our lust and our jealousy and our anger and our pride and our self-centeredness, it'll be visible on the pages of the book. And our only hope in that moment is that Jesus has taken the judgment we deserve for our sins. And we've put our faith and our hope and our life in him, understanding that he was bruised for our transgressions, wounded for our iniquity, that he felt the full measure of hell for six hours, one Friday, hanging on the cross, that he paid the debt for every sin so that by by believing in him, we could have life. So this isn't the time to be on the fence. It's not the time to be like, well, I'm a little bit of a Christian or I'm a slightly engaged Christian. Or no, it's, it's time to really ask yourself, am I following God or am I following culture? Have I committed my, do I really believe? I've had the opportunity many times to sit with people in the final moments of their life. About five years ago, somebody that we knew called and said, hey, um, 
we got a friend who's got cancer. He's been moved into a hospice. Young man, early 30s. Would you go see him? And so we, we, didn't, we didn't know him. That's basically all the context we had. We drove, uh, we drove to Edmonton and then east. Um, Va- Vagerville. It's got a giant egg. That's what I remember most. Okay, he's got a big egg. If you, if you ever want to go see the biggest egg, go to Vagerville. I went into the hospice, and there was a guy named Tim. And he had cancer through his entire body. He was scared. He had no faith, no Christian background. Natasha and I were just talking about him yesterday. And we stepped into the room with somebody who was on the edge of eternity and had the opportunity to talk to him about Christ and the love that Jesus has for him. And we led him to the Lord and prayed with him. And I'm sure that someday I'm going to see Tim in heaven. You know what? 24 hours later, he was gone. My encouragement to you is make the decision before it's decision time. Don't, don't wait until there's a couple seconds left on the, on the clock because you have no idea. We just don't know. There are things we don't know. We don't know the day or the hour of Christ's return. So make the decision before it's decision time. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? It doesn't mean that we believe he was a historical figure. It doesn't even mean that we believe he was God. The devil believes both of those things. It means that we believe I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I've tried. It doesn't work. I'm separated from God. I feel it in my heart. I know something's missing. And I understand that Jesus gave his life in my place so that my relationship with God could be reconciled and I could have eternal life with him. And in the end, whether it's my end or the world's end, I'm confident I've got hope that goes beyond this world. That's what it means to believe. And so my, my challenge today is to two groups of people. Because there are believers in this room. You would say, oh, I have a relationship with Jesus. I'd like to suggest that if we truly have a relationship with Christ and we truly believe that he will return someday and will reign and rule with him, if that's truly a conviction you hold in your heart, then, then being a desperate inviter of people to Christ is the only way to live. Renting the Jack Singer concert hall is not a publicity stunt or something experienced church does for headlines. We've been doing it since 2016 because we really believe that someday Jesus will come back. And it might be today and it might be in 100 years. But in that time, we're going to do everything we can to help other people know what it is to have life in him. So you bring people to Jesus. If you're a believer, you bring people to Christ. That's what you do. An easy way to do that is to grab an invite, grab a door hanger, make an invitation. That's the first group. And the second group of people in the room today in the Southwest campus right now are people who have not made the decision to truly believe that Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life, and that you need him to move forward. So I'm gonna pray before we leave. I'd like to invite everybody in both locations to stand to their feet. I want to pray for both of those groups of people. And so if you're here today and you would say, you're a Christian, but wow, there are people in your life that need Christ and you want to live with that heart, that, that desperation to help introduce them to Jesus. You just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. God, right now, you know Every son, every daughter, every mother, every father, every friend, every family member, every coworker, every neighbor that's far from you. God, if we truly believe that you are returning any day to rule and reign, God, then then would you help us to live with unbridled passion to help others come to know you? God, would we bring people to church, bring people to hope? God, God, would we introduce them to you? God, would we give our lives to this most important thing with our hearts set on eternity. And if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you've been living your life, but you know it's empty, it's incomplete, there's something missing, I believe God brought you into this room so that 
a divine introduction could be made between you and the savior of your soul. His name is Jesus and he wants relationship with you. And if you know it's time to get that relationship right, I'm gonna count to three and I'm gonna ask you to slip your hand up really quick, both locations when I hit three. If that's you here in the Southeast, if that's you in the Southwest, here we go. One, two, that's you. It's time to get things right with Christ. Three, go ahead, slip up your hand real quick. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Many hands. You can put your hands down. If you raised your hand or maybe you made that decision in your heart, I'm gonna ask you to repeat this simple prayer after me. And EC, I'm gonna ask that we all pray it together. Let's support our friends who are making this decision today. Say, Jesus, I need you. I can't do life without you. Come into my heart. Forgive me my sins. I trust you with my future. Amen.